this week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. Well, I would say to respect every stage of your life as a writer. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers, and welcome back to the podcast. Just to follow up on everything I said last time, I want you to know that the fam and I had a great time skiing in the Taos area. I think Ralph and I skied every trail on angel fire wonderful time got back just in time to launch my new novel shameless the third book in the kinsey rivera series which just came out as we record this yesterday so as you're listening to it it is on sale now in both paper and ebook editions and most importantly you remember what we were saying about tiktok last time I got my first TikTok mention that I know of last week from Sydney Bean. That's Sydney with several Ys. Look it up. But she reviews books. And was I, I, I think it was Splitsville, the first one, made, made a TikTok recommendation thing. And then it flipped over and it was a coho book, Colleen Hoover, you know, the, the queen of TikTok. So I kind of feel like I've made the big time now. Jesse, how you doing? I am doing well. Yeah, so it's not it's not snowing, so that's no, nice. No, not snowing in Tulsa. So, no, but you got to you got to come up with something equivalent to my TikTok appearance. Mm. What have you got? What have I got? What have I and got? the and the cruise is over. So the that cruise was... is over. But I did reach out to the exec, the executive director of Gaze in Space, to do an interview interview with. So for my podcast. So hopefully, uh, he gets back to me. So well, that sounds fun. now tell me, tell everybody what's the name of the podcast? Uh, pod for good, pod for right. good. I don't know why I keep right. with a number four. Words. Yes, right. pod the number four. <laughs> good, fantastic, good for you. Let me make another quick mention of WriterCon, our annual writers conference, Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma City. Although you can watch it from home if you prefer, we have added even more authors and agents and publishers. I ramped up on the fantasy, thinking probably about the story last week about Brandon Sanderson, who's now up to about 30 million. (laughs) No, we did not get Brandon Sanderson. I don't think he ever Mm. needs to go anywhere again in his life, but we do have a lot of fantasy authors and some other great people, agents and publishers on the roster for WriterCon 2022. Uh, and I, I, I want to, you know, I talk always about authors and agents and whatnot, but we have a whole category on the speakers page called author assistants, which I think sometimes people undervalue. But these are going to be people like uh, publicists and people know who are now to f- format books or to help you publish books, uh, things that are becoming increasingly important in the modern publishing age uh, age we also have a lot of attention to the inspirational or, or christian market which may or may not be your focus but let me tell you it is one of the few sectors of the book market which is actually booming right now so of course we're going to cover it that's writercon 2022 over labor day weekend that's september 2nd to 5th and for more information or to register, you should visit writercon.com. That's W R I T E R C O N dot C O M. My super special guest today is Erica Ferencik, the critically acclaimed author of The River at Night and Into the Jungle, novels featuring women facing extreme physical challenges as well as internal struggles. But she has a new novel just released titled Girl on Ice, Girl in Ice, rather, which combines uh, contemporary environmental issues with a absolutely spellbinding mystery thriller set in the Arctic Circle. I mean, this is a unique book, and I am very anxious to talk to her about her work and her writing process. But first, 
the news. So item number one, Amazon announced this week that they are now opening up advertising, Amazon marketing ads, AMS, sometimes people call it, to traditionally published authors. In the past, they've only made this available to people who are self-publishing, which makes a certain sense. You publish a book, and now it's one of six million on Amazon, so (laughs) you pay them a little bit more money to get some better placement in people's book searches. Well, now they're making that available to traditionally published authors. So even if you're being published by one of the big five in New York, or for that matter, a smaller or regional publisher, you can still take out ads at Amazon and try and get your book greater visibility. This is a significant game changer, and I think it's going to make a big difference in not only the way books are marketed, but people's decisions when they're you know deciding what course to take. Am I going to go traditional publishing? Am I going to do it myself or small press or regional press? And let me tell you, the initial reactions to this news story are all over the place. Some people think that this could affect publishers' marketing expectations. Like now every publisher, no matter how large, is going to expect authors to get more involved in marketing of their books. Well, guess what? They already do. But now they may actually expect you to lay out some money, possibly, to take out these Amazon ads because you can. I know uh, this didn't, ex- I know I'm dating myself. My first book was published in 91, but I did everything I could think of to publish the book. You know, I made these little uh, folders with the glossy Xerox copies of the cover and made up my own press releases and sent them everywhere. I don't know if it made any difference or not, but it's your first book. You want to do everything possible. So I can totally see authors doing this, no matter who their publisher publishing is. I think it's probably going to be challenging to run profitable ads for people with Uh, you know, say only one book. So uh, I don't know. Jesse, what do you think? Good idea? Bad idea? I will quickly summarize my my point, which was I'm just worried about an onslaught of ads. Right, right. Well, except you can't avoid them because anytime you search for anything, the top two entries at least will say sponsored ad in in small type, and then they give you books. And then after that, the things you're actually looking for. And let me just say, sneakers, if you're searching for a book by somebody you know and love and is probably spending on the, uh, money on those ads, don't click the ones that say sponsored ad because they're going to have to pay for that click. Find another <laughs> click that isn't going to cost them anything. What bothers me, and I wish we could tell Amazon and Google to stop this, but if, I, if I'm searching for something perfectly, And it's going to be the first Mm -hmm. organic thing that comes up. Don't show me the ad for it right beforehand. Like, that's just wasteful. Right. right. That's exactly what I could put in Shameless by William Bernhardt. But the first two are going to be sponsored ads, maybe for that book. And then you get to the unsponsored one for the same book. And that's the one you should click on. Well, we don't know how this will play out, sneakers. But here is some advice from me to you. Here's what I think. One. Don't spend money on ads until you've got more than one book out because then it might make sense because the ad's going to cost you something. You're only making a percentage of the profit anyway. So your margin is going to shrink dramatically and it's probably not going to be a profitable deal unless, of course, you're thinking, well, I'll get them hooked on my work. I'll get them hooked on the first book in a series. I'll take a loss leader, basically, on the first book, and then maybe it might make sense. Two, if you're concerned about money, don't take out an ad unless the book has already earned out. And here I'm thinking about people in traditional publishing who may have gotten an advance. They're increasingly small these days, but let that earn out before you start advertising. Otherwise, you're just taking money away from yourself. And three, never bother running ads on full 
price trade books. As you probably know, traditional publishers are skyrocketing the prices on ebooks. In some cases, the hardcover is less expensive than the ebook because they don't want you to buy the ebook. And New York thinks as soon as everybody's reading ebook, they're toast. So if you've got an ebook that's impossibly priced, there is probably no reason whatsoever for you to be taking out these ads, all right? All right, move on to item number two, which, big surprise, also has to do with Amazon, that which sells more than 50% of is all this books. A, is this an Amazon you... Daily Double that we have for today's news thing? I don't <laughs> yeah, have that sound effect, right. sadly, but I would play it if I had it. <laughs> I will insert should. it for our, our podcast listeners. That sound wasn't originally there. Soon I will just be saying, but first the news Amazon, from Amazon, yeah. because that's what drives the market. Number two, Amazon has launched their answer to Clubhouse with an, and, and, and that's going to interest budding DJs, of which apparently there are many. Let me explain why. First, everybody knows what Clubhouse is. We've talked about it before on the podcast. It's basically an audio-only uh, way of you know doing things like this, the podcast, or uh, you know videos like you see on Facebook or Instagram or whatnot, but it's audio-only and it's Clubhouse. And people can create their little clubhouse. We did a bunch of these before WriterCon last year, and actually they were well attended. It was a good no, 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 it wasn't Clubhouse. We did Twitter Spaces, which is exactly the same thing, except on Twitter, where I thought I had more followers. So that made sense. Clubhouse uh, and has done the, uh, well, though. So, of course, now Amazon is doing their version, which is going to be called AMP. That's A M P. It's basically the same thing as Clubhouse. With one big difference, Amazon has negotiated some music licensing deals, probably going hand in hand with the Amazon Music Service. They already have. That's why I can hear virtually every song known to mankind in the morning through my Alexa device. Anyway, they've negotiated with the major labels as well as independents so that hosts using AMP can stream songs, no subscription required. Now, just what what would that do to us, Jesse, if in, instead of the same, ca we could suddenly start, what would, I mean, what would be the theme song for Girl in Ice, for mm. instance? You're as cold yeah, as ice yeah. or something yeah. Just like all, that. All willing. ice songs. Just all songs that talk about ice. Right, right. So we could have the ice, something from Frozen, yes, yep, I guess, yep. would be appropriate. Yep. Um, I don't know. Is that even a thing to be able to stream songs in the middle of a clubhouse type I thing? I don't know who this is for. Like, are they trying to yeah. recreate the listening to an album in your college dorm room sort of situation? Or is this yeah, just so you can use music yep. inside a clubhouse type thing, which again, I don't know how useful that's going to be. So, well, for, I mean, it might make a cool 20 second segue, but you know, it, how much is that really yeah. worth? Or, uh, I don't know. Everybody apparently wants to be a DJ these days. I don't quite get that, but it seems to be a deal. Yeah, I don't know. You'd be an excellent I'd DJ. I'd be a great DJ, but there are already people who I know and like who are DJs, and I don't want to, you know, invade their space. But I also don't know who's going to show up for a <laughs> DJ session on their phone, right? You go to, you right, go to see a DJ right. to dance, so. Well, good point. But. All right, let's move on to our interview. My guest today, as I've already told you, is the incredible Erica Ferencik, the author of three novels, most recently, such an intriguing premise and original idea, and, 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 and she knows what she's talking about in this book, too. Anyway, her new book is called Girl on Ice, just released this month. Erica, are you on board with us? I She's see her back. face, but it's got your name on it, Jesse. There you are. Hi, Erica. How Hi. are you doing today? Good. Okay. How are you guys? Not the traditional first question. Did I come anywhere close to pronouncing your last name correctly? You did good. You did great. Um, it's forensic, like forensic. Dead people. Oh, like yeah. like right. And it's girl in ice, not girl on ice. That must be some skating novel somewhere. No, in ice. So. I've got it over my shoulder. I he corrected yeah. that. Uh, I was for <laughs> for the people uh, watching on Facebook. Like I was very worried because Erica said she was going to do a thing and come back, and she like 
well, I could not see her until like five seconds before Bill <laughs> asked her. I was like, oh my God. No, I was just okay. standing right here listening. I, you know you know how you sit yeah. all day? It's like if I sit one more second, I was just so I'll worried. die. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I was just standing here looking out my window, listening to you guys and realizing that I'll never catch up with all of this stuff. You know, uh, uh, of, did, I mean, you do you know. want to? I, <laughs> no. Your book seems to be, you know, you've got about eight endorsements on the back cover. Great reviews. Uh, maybe you don't need TikTok or maybe that's just uh, heresy to oh, say. Oh, I think we all need TikTok. Yeah. I mean, the numbers <laughs> you were talking about. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I haven't, I have not mastered that yet. But you, have you started an account on TikTok? Uh, I do. Yes, of course. Yeah. But you I, have to, you have to produce content, right? I mean, isn't that the whole yeah, deal? I don't know that you have to, but <laughs> you've got to open an idea. account. <laughs> Jesse, yeah. do you have to? I mean, you, I opened it so I could see my the vi video that was about me and my uh, books. Yeah, oh. I mean, I during the um, sea shanty tea talk craze, I like made an account <laughs> just so I could see some of those, not on like not on YouTube. But yeah, it's it's you you have to sort of constantly be making video content, which is exhausting and hard, and yeah. I don't want to do it. It's exhausting, it's time consuming. Those book talk videos, I mean, Barnes and Noble has entire tables now where they displaying big, you know, popular on book talk, and I could totally see Girl and Ice being the sort of you know you've got a strong female protagonist and a really interesting. Uh, premise and dramatic situation. I could see this taking off. Um, well, that would be great. Maybe yeah. I have to hire someone to creatively figure out what they might do on <laughs> what what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to like cry or something or you know be emotional about the ending and or something like that or I, I think it does help if you've got own. an emotional yeah. ending. I, I think you should yeah, just yeah. write chanties about your book. Uh, people seem to really like those. So, <laughs> or a little dancing. Yeah, people love dancing. Yeah, you know, it's it just all boils down to we'll just never write another word again because what we're doing is is all this stuff. But um, you know, that's, okay, that's the way it is. Well, so now that we're about like ten minutes into the interview, let me ask the first question. <laughs> which sure, is, sure. If you could give a writer one piece of advice, what would it be? Only, I mean, um, I know you could give many, but pick one because I know a lot of people listening to this are either writers or aspiring mm -hmm. writers. So, what do you have to say? What advice would you give? <laughs> well, I would say to respect every stage of your life as a writer. I mean, I was extremely hard on myself, I'm still hard on myself. In fact, I'm hard, I'm, I'm, I beat myself up for beating myself up, you know. <laughs> So, I mean, I feel like uh, there's a word out there, it's, it's success, and that is a bitch of a word, because, you know, we ask ourselves all the time, are we successful, are we successful, and I feel like if I had, uh, you know, listened to that, you know, it took me 35 years to publish a book tradi in the traditional marketplace, um, mm -hmm. and I feel like if we judge ourselves really, really with, with a word like that, then we're defeating ourselves. I mean, we learn so much. We don't even know what we're learning. We don't even right. realize how much we're learning by, by writing, by reading, by listening, uh, by, by being passionate about what we're doing. I just wish I, it's persistence and learning. I think that those two things can pull you through anything. I, I and, think... and, and that deep love for what you're doing. Right. I mean, you can no matter what kind of criticism you get um, or any kind of feedback, you, you know, you can vet that. You can vet mm -hmm. that. You can think, okay, who's giving me this advice and, and why are they doing it? And I would also say, I know I'm giving you a bunch of things. You asked for one, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's just... A, it's one umbrella topic, so umbrella. you're okay. <laughs> so just... No matter what, just hold on to this little kernel, this kryptonite hard kernel that believes that you have something to say in an yeah. original way. And if you if you if you hold on to that um, and you're persistent and learn, I think that you'll go far. It may take you a mm -hmm. while, but this is a very complex thing. Right. Writing a novel is, is incredibly complex and demanding. 
I agree. I agree 100 yeah, percent right? with everything it's you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know. I don't even know. And it's not what getting kind of easier. What's that? <laughs> and it's not getting easier. I you thought know, at some just... point I'd be coasting, but I'm not. No, I mean I'm I'm, you know, and I mean this is I'm thinking about my next novel and just how you know it's just another Everest. Yeah. You know, we're facing this. It's the next yeah. mountain. No, and it's um, persistence, but don't forget why you, I mean, we're all in this because we love books, right? Right. And we'd rather be doing this than anything else on earth. But I do think sometimes people lose sight of that and yeah. and it becomes drudgery or it becomes a competition. And it, there's yeah. no point in that, right? Because you're never, yeah. even if you scale one mountain, there's somebody else who's done something else. Nobody gets everything. Just right. chill. It, and in the arts, you know, you're up, you're down, you're all around. So true. You know, one minute you have a movie deal, the next minute that goes up in smoke, and then yeah. your friend has a movie deal, and okay, <laughs> you know, uh, you have to sort of meditate on back to, like, why you love this. You know, right. what was it that you read when you were you were perhaps younger that just moved you so much that you decided, I want to be able to give that to people? Because I do believe, you know, writing a novel is, it's an act of generosity and it's an act of love where we're, we're just giving something of ourselves um, that hopefully has value for right. some people. Right. I mean, what else is it? Yeah. I you know it's entertainment, but entertainment is a very profound word. Right. You know, right. Profound concept. And, I, and, and there's nothing wrong with being entertaining, but the best entertaining, I think, has an extra layer. Right. There's something right. else, too. There's a takeaway or a right. reason why it moves you or sticks with you or. Mm -hmm whatever yeah it teaches you about about life yeah anyway, as you're anyway go ahead no and i was just gonna say that girl in ice is a good <laughs> example of that so i've already given them hints and dribbles but talk a little bit tell us about the book yeah so um girl in ice is about an american linguist named val who is tasked to go to a very remote climate research station off the coast of greenland where a girl has thawed from a glacier alive, speaking a language no one understands. Um, eight months before the novel begins, Val's twin brother, Andy, walks out Arctic night, 50 degrees below zero, and freezes to death. Val doesn't know if he took his own life. He was a depressed guy about climate change, especially, but she has her sus suspicions. So the, the novel begins where Val gets an email from Wyatt. Wyatt was one of the only other people up there. And Wyatt is begging her to come up and try and figure out what this girl is saying. This girl is talking, no one understands what she's saying. And in the email is a little clip of the girl speaking. And Val doesn't understand a word she's saying, but she does hear fear and terror and trauma. So for the first time in, in Val's life, she has, to, she has her own problems. She has a pretty severe um, anxiety disorder. She's only comfortable in a few places. So she has to decide if she's going to go way up mm -hmm. there and try to understand this girl and also kind of figure out what happened to her brother. Right. So right. that's the premise and the beginning of the story. No, it's a, it's a terrific premise and a terrific story. And let me just say, while I'm thinking about it, because I can see people are already chatting in the chat box, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Erica, just type them in there, and I will make sure she asks, answers your questions. Sure. I don't see them, but you do, right? I do, yeah. <laughs> Jesse does, too. You guys too. are very, very professional. This is very cool. Well, we've done it before. You've done this, it a few times. Okay. Hey, you actually went to Greenland, right, to research yep. this book? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, you know, you can look at pictures of a place mm -hmm. and read about it, but until you go there, I guess I guess I didn't I was shocked by the scale of things. I mean, this this island is a third the size of Canada. Uh, it's an ice sheet that's 1,500 miles north to south, 700 miles east to west. The ice sheet itself is two miles deep, mm -hmm. frozen for three million years. And it's surrounded by these black mountains that just jut up out of the sea. So it's this giant bowl. 
And to get there, you fly over these mountains and no one lives on the ice cap. So you, mm -hmm. we stayed in this tiny little town. And another thing is there are only 56,000 people on this entire land mass. I mean, there's a local community college with 56,000 people there. Mm. So no one is, lives there. And it's a hunting and subs subsistence culture, which is again, something, one thing to read about and another to witness people mm -hmm. hunting seals people um people might hunt a pilot whale to feed their dogs a can of dog food is like eight dollars wow. because it's that much to fly it in from europe so um and it's an amazing country because it's so close to prehistory uh, as recently as 1950 people had no contact with the outside world 1950 1950 yeah right and they lived in these things called sod houses they were there these are you know during the extremely short summer season about 30 days people would dig into the ground close to the shore close to a good hunting place uh and cover this hole with whale ribs and seal skins peat and rocks and four or five families would live in this for 10 months a year. Mm. And mm -hmm. um, I in actually interviewed a, um, one of the mayors of this tiny town and he, he was born in one of these, 70 years old, wow. seven zero years old. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, you know, and he left it at, at age seven. And I said, how did you feel? Electricity, running water, how did you feel? And he said, I never felt the same. I never, I miss the feeling of closeness I had with the people I lived with because we lived together, we hunted together, we cooked together, we made up songs, we spoke. So that was the last thing I expected him to say. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was really interesting. Wow. Now, I, I re read about you going on some uh, kind of sketchy helicopter rides and even doing some <laughs> kayaking, right? Yeah, it was. A, I mean, it wasn't a sketchy helicopter ride, but I'd never been in one before. And just the the feeling of like I was I got in I'm like yeah we're really gonna take off this is ridiculous and just the feeling of you know lifting from the ground mm. was was something for me but anyway that's not so unique but uh we did kayak and actually Greenlanders um invented kayaks and they were originally uh -huh. made from uh whalebone and seal skin but in any case we're in modern kayaks and we went to this place called the iceberg graveyard and these great, I mean, these icebergs are 10, 12 stories high mm -hmm. and they're blocks long and they're carved by wind and waves to these weird, weird shapes. And we're in there with our kayaks, you know, and you're always hearing explosions everywhere, muffled far away. Things are breaking, things are calving, you know. And I said to our guide, I said, so what if one of these big, huge monsters breaks? And he said, well, you should be listening, listening. Um, if you hear it break, turn your kayak toward the sound because a massive wave will be created. And if, you're, you're, if your side is to the wave, you'll, you know, you'll flip. So he didn't say you're going to live. He just said, <laughs> turn your kayak toward the sound. And we just looked at each other like, okay, I guess we're here. What are we, what are we going to do? Leave? I mean, you know, we're here. And so we just, um, I really listen. I mean, I really learned a lot about fear in all my um, research trips. Uh, evidently. Especially in the jungle. That was quite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, was for into maybe, the jungle, I'm guessing. For into the jungle. Yeah. I spent a month in Peru uh, researching that book. Wow. So. Okay. I, I assume this is okay for me to say because it's on the mm. book jacket. <laughs> oh, okay. But your book has a somewhat uh, science fictional premise in that it involves the girl in ice, a girl mm -hmm. who's been frozen for a long time. She's thought out, she's alive, and she's speaking in a language no one understands, right? Yep. Where did that come from? I mean, do you have a background in linguistics or did you invent this language or what? I invented the language. I studied, I uh, read books on, ling you know, to research this book, I read books on linguistics. I read every book I could on Greenland, on the Arctic Circle. Um, and to create her language, I listened to all the Nordic languages, you know, Finnish, 
um, Danish, of course, Greenlandic, Icelandic to sort of uh, learn some morphemes, some sound units that, that I could use to create my own language. Um, I needed it to sound Nordic, but not right. actually be another language. Mm -hmm. The actual story came about, uh, I was walking by my house in the winter of 2018 and frozen, really freezing cold day. And there's a pond, there's a pond behind my house and there were three juvenile painted turtles and they were frozen just mid stroke, you know, and they didn't look alive but they didn't look dead either so i ran home and i researched creatures that could do that that could freeze and thaw out alive turns out there are many that can i'm not talking about just torpor i'm talking of frozen mm. wood turtles mm -hmm. um some some crocodiles can do it some alligators can do it some kinds of fish um they possess a certain cryoprotein that we do not possess um mm. that protects the cells so when an, when you know, think of an ice cube and, and how jagged that is. That's what would destroy a cell if it froze. Um, that said, we can freeze um, an embryo. It's only 120 cells. We have the technology for that. But um, anyway, I came home and I just thought of a girl in a glacier and I could see her foot, you know, just the side of her foot. And it just looked like she was running from something. And so... I just had to ask myself, what is she running from? You know, who is this kid? What happened to her? So, you know, I went back and back and back to figure that out. And mm. I mean, I love stories that, uh, I mean, I love, I love, you say science fiction. I, I don't know what, you know, we have all these definitions and they're frustrating, right? Right. So frustrating. Thriller, mystery, suspense. I guess I like writing along the edge of, what's real and what kind of could be sure well but that isn't, isn't that, that kind of every novel but <laughs> yeah no but i mean every novel but i'm saying you know girl and ice is such that i mean i had to write the scene where she thawed in such a way that i was almost convincing myself um that is along the, the line of what can and cannot be one day we could probably figure it out sure well who who but, knows right I read so? I re read somewhere that you came across an Inuit word for joy in being alive. Do you remember the word? I don't remember the word. I don't even pretend to speak Greenlandic. It's a very <laughs> complex language and the words are extremely long. But I think that language reveals culture. Uh, and in that case, there is a word for joy in being feeling as if you are one with nature we don't have yeah. a word like that in our no, culture we don't there's a beautiful word in japanese shibui which means the beauty of aging mm. now there's another word we don't have in this culture because we worship youth and beauty and sexiness mm. right so you don't even have you don't even think consciously of how words are shaping our thoughts but they are you know and there's a word in greenlandic for climate change, that means a friend acting strangely. So what does that mean? It means they see nature as a friend. We often have a combative relationship with nature. We have a snowstorm here in the Northeast and it's, you know, snowmageddon and we all have to buy canned soup and freak out, you know, instead of, well, it's snowing, we're in the Northeast. Yeah, Maybe that's normal, expect. let's go and enjoy it. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful. Of, yeah. So you've been know, getting... You've been getting fabulous advanced press for this book. I mentioned all the reviews and endorsements. You even got the coveted sidebar profile in Publishers Weekly. So you must be feeling pretty good. And it's your third book. You must be feeling pretty good right now, yes? Yes. I mean, um, it's it's really wonderful. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of gobsmacked, as they say. Yeah, well... <laughs> Very well earned. Very grateful. Hey, I mentioned there are people sending questions. Jenny, sure. first of all, says, hey, I'm in the Northeast, and she's ready for a storm tomorrow. <laughs> and I then, know, we're supposed to have some rain. And then she asks, is this a standalone novel, or is it going to be part of a series? Well, if someone hands me a million dollars, I'll make it a series, but I have no right. intention of... Uh, <laughs> I'm a standalone kind of a gal. I mm -hmm. like to move along and create something else. 
-hmm. And I think when you read it, you may feel the same way. Although someone has said, you need to write another one, you know. Mm -hmm. But I never have done that. I think that's a particular skill, a particular state of mind. Yeah, and a different kind of writing, yes. Here's another question. I hear a lot of authors say they're either morning or evening writers. Which are you? I'm a solid second shifter. Um, I, <laughs> What's that I, afternoon or? <laughs> oh yeah, it's like a, I'm like a two to niner. Um, I, you know, I I get stuff done in the morning, other kinds of work, uh, exercise, and mm-hmm. you name it. And then I try to be. I work in the shed. It's not sexy. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> we know we're we're, right. we're alone when we work, or you know, I I'm jealous of these writers that can go to starbucks or something and have people around right yeah i mean i could do that i just why i have chairs and a coffee machine here i don't (laughs) i yeah people some might want the human company but they don't anyway that would be too distracting so yeah i like afternoons into evenings um i like it dark and cold and you know i love storms and you know because otherwise you know we have kids who live nearby and it's the screams of the, the kids and you know so yeah i haven't when it's dark i have been thinking about getting one of those fancy apple desktop studio computers though just to make my desk look better because right now it's just it's a desk it's flat it's got a few books on it and some notes. it's not glamorous at all well you get the work done you get the job done which is of course the most important thing so pantser or planner do you oh, out- total planner? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I come up with an idea, and you know how it is. Um, I have to vet the idea. The idea has to have legs. It has to be something that I can that I can actually write. You know, that being the person I am, yeah, sure, do research, but um, and I have to you know live with it for a couple of weeks or before I actually believe that it is the book to write. Because as we know you have to be passionate about your idea for years, right. four years, five years I've been working on this and passed it into, you know, publicity time and marketing time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have the idea, I stretch it out into three acts. And for the first four months, I, I write an outline, a very detailed outline. Um, and then, and only then when I'm happy with that, do I write a first draft. Mm-hmm. and after the first draft, I will go on if I need to go on a research trip. Yeah. Because the, these books are not travel logs. It's, no. it's this, the human story comes first. But, well, that makes sense to me because after you've started the story, then you know much more specifically what you need, right? You're what not the just hell I need messing around. To know yeah. And experience. <laughs> and, you know, if I need to interview someone, what do I ask them? Right. Who, who am I interviewing them and why? And, um, but then again, there's the joy of going there and saying, oh, my God, I didn't realize, for example, in Greenland, I didn't realize, I don't know what we're breathing here, but it's not air. I mean, the it's air there like is that. so, I mean, I was high. Mm. For a month. It was just cold and clean and, and, and just everything I learned that I didn't know was the case. Right. Now, I don't want to encourage bad habits, but you talked about, you know, you have to be passionate about the idea. It's going to take years. Have you ever started something and not fit, followed through, not finished it? Oh, for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How far? I mean, I have a few that I've um, done several chapters of and thought, nah, this isn't working. I Never did it mind. last year. Yeah. I was so, I was like, Erica, how can you be, have done this for so long? And not knowing yourself well enough to know mm. this is not going to work. And it there was, are a couple times. I, awful. Yeah. I, hated, I hated losing the month there. That was the worst part. You know, right, losing right. six months or whatever. bullshit. Except it wasn't. You were warming up to your next mm. book. So. Oh, I don't know. Clearing the clutter. <laughs> yeah, well. I was about to say, and I have a few instances where I've actually finished a first draft and <sighs> th- found that I had no desire to <laughs> and that's usually <laughs> the good up. part you know the first draft is hard for me anyway the revision yep. is the pleasure when i get to the end of the first draft and think i don't even want to read that again that's a pretty good <gasps> sign this awful. didn't work 
Yeah. Um, sorry to hear. No, I mean, I mean, I guess I would say all of my earlier novels were just <laughs> before I understood structure and before right. I really vetted so the important. idea. You know, I just I was just like, oh, that sounds good. I like that. You know. Um, and then you get older and you're like, wow, how many more years am I going to live? <laughs> I, mean, I want to use my time well. Right. You know? It needs to be worth the investment. Absolutely. Exactly. Do you have any tricks or strategies you use for bringing your characters to life on the uh, page? Um, nothing too crazy. I'd like to sort of put together opposite, you know, the, the charming psychopath. Um, just diametric opposite characteristics help me think about who a character might be. Um, I do... Uh, I do all the typical stuff. What does the character want? What's in the way of what the character wants? Right, you know, as I'm outlining, you know, I, I'm outlining, but I'm also, you know, writing in the voice of the character. What do they want? What's in the, you know, so I don't have any, I don't have any crazy, you know, tricks. Right, it's so difficult, I think. And I don't know why we talk to different people all day long. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hard yeah. to, and same with story. We absorb story all day long. The human brain needs story to be mentally healthy. But coming up with something? Right, right. Coming up with like, your own? Yeah, it's like music. It's like, oh, yeah, box concerto number five. That's so easy. I could do that. <laughs> you violin. That's fine. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Like, how hard can it be? <laughs> then you try, and it's like, okay, let's just let's pick some work. You talked a little bit about where the plot idea for this story came from. Are there any particular themes or other ideas you wanted to explore with this? Um, well, I wanted to, I guess, besides, you know, my love of science and language, uh, there was a scene in uh, an early version of Frankenstein, black and white, where it's the toward the end of the movie and he's all beaten and bloody and hunted and he's kind of disappearing into this lizard he's this black blocky silhouette mm -hmm. disappearing into this blizzard that's in front of mont blanc and just just that feeling uh that is just that that scene has haunted me my whole life and i'm still trying to figure out why i just wanted somehow to pull that into into the book not that frankenstein is in the book right. i don't mean to say that <laughs> um, but um yeah and there's a the theme of grief uh you know val is mm -hmm. grieving her brother sure. um jean who is sort of the grunt who works in the station she's she's grieving her the loss of her husband and son in a car crash and I'm really interested in how people deal with grief, how they get through it, the defenses they create, um, the ways they don't face it, mm -hmm. and what they do. Um, so everyone was grieving something in this novel. Sure. I did that quite consciously, actually, um, not to make it you know, depressing. I don't think it's depressing. I think we're all grieving something at some time, a friendship, a decade, something. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. We're all grieving something. <laughs> Right. It's kind of chronic and uh, constant. Okay. One last question for you, Erica. Since yeah. this is a standalone novel, what's next? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> you mentioned your next book before. I did. So all I can really say is that it is another thriller uh, with a speculative element and in it, nature fights back Sounds and intriguing. it's called the intelligence and that's all i can really say right now do we know so. when we might see it a long long time from now. <laughs> <laughs> still working on it huh? <laughs> no i'm really really hoping late 2023 i'm really really you know how the but then you have the you know the publishing cycle so you know that yep. that takes six six to eight months at Absolutely. least well, congratulations again on this book. The reviews and press have been fantastic. I Thank predict you. you're going to have a hit on your hand. So no. way to go. <laughs> that would be nice. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks so much, guys. It's such an honor to be here. I have already learned so much by listening to your <laughs> previous shows. And uh, yeah, it's a must listen for me from now on.
Fantastic. I didn't even know that. Well, anyway, it was great. <laughs> Thank I'm you. like, I, you know, I got to keep up with this stuff. Uh, just spread the yes. word. We want everybody right. to feel that way. <laughs> I know. I mean, I got to get out of my shed a little bit. And like, right. you know, figure out what's going on. All right. So. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Like I said before, annual Writers Conference, WriterCon 2022. Authors, agents, editors, book marketers, author ass assistants, author over 70 sessions, and many, many chances for you to meet other people and network and get the connections and knowledge that you're going to need to take your writing career up to the next level. And right now, as I'm recording this, you can get the early bird price, but it will not be available for too much longer. So if you're thinking about coming, uh, might go to the website and think about registering now. That's writercon.com. And I will make a completely self-promotional reminder that my new book, Shameless, is now on sale. That's the third book in my Kinsey Rivera legal thriller series. This time, Kinsey's handling a case that comes a little bit too close to home for comfort. And if you are writing sneakers or aspiring to write, as I assume you are since you're listening to this podcast, join our Facebook group, Red Sneaker Writers, so you can get daily updates and chat and networking and hear what everybody has to say. I've also got a free Red Sneaker Writers newsletter that goes out more or less every other week. So send me your email address and I'll add you to the list. Send that to either by Facebook or to will to me at wilburn at gmail.com. W-I-L-L-B-E-R-N at gmail.com. Until next time, sneakers, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.